888-971-SAGE, 888-971-7243. Larry Elder from the ReliefFactor.com studios. This is phone bro Friday. Next segment, I'll be welcoming to the program my brother Kirk. We'll be giving away a MyPillow to the winner. And both contestants will get copies of my last book and also a copy of my collection of essays called Double Standards, Selective Outrage from the Left. More on this in due course. Now, for several days, I've been trying to get to Wynton Marsalis, the jazz trumpeter, brilliant jazz trumpeter. I saw him play with the Cleveland Orchestra when I lived there. Cleveland Orchestra is is said to be one of the five best orchestras in the country. And he was masterful. And was interviewed by Jonathan Capehart, who is a left-wing columnist for the Washington Post. And I have a feeling that Capehart was pretty stunned with some of the things that Wynton Marsalis said, especially the things he said about rap and hip-hop and how much more damaging he feels they are to our country uh, than to the than the existence of, for example, a statue of Robert E. Lee. Wynton Marsalis was one of those responsible for getting that statue moved, and he's saying rap and hip-hop and the coarse language to describe blacks, women, has a more pernicious effect on society than the presence of a Robert E. Lee statue. When you have somebody like Kanye West with the platform that he has and the millions of people who listen to what he says, even though he has a product to sell. He's, um, he's already said what he had to say. They buy his products. His products say much worse than that. I'll guarantee you, if you put four of his, let's get his first four products and read through the lyrics of that, it's much worse than that. It's like what I think about the Robert E. Lee statue and, and stuff, this pipeline of filth into the community every day. Yeah, you know, we could talk about Robert E. Lee. I'm all for that. But we could talk about Kanye West. But what about these products that they're putting out that nobody's talking about? And by products, he's referring to the rap and hip-hop. Well, we, what we've done in my adult time and what the decisions we've made as a culture, not just black people, <laughs> okay? Well, That's not, I can't, you can't, I mean, I don't, I don't know what prism you have to look, look through to say, wow, great, this is fantastic. I don't say it. I don't care how popular stuff is. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Well, what responsibility then do white people have for the the racial conundrum that we're in? We all have a responsibility. We all have a responsibility. I'm responsible to some white kids that come to study with me, not just to teach them about black kids, to teach them what I know about life. We are all responsible. We're all culpable. We don't. We don't. We don't. um, We don't separate our lives. And in this in this country, into white and black in such a clear way, that I say, well, I have a white student. I'm going to teach them less. I can't tell them. I'm going to teach them more. So we're all culpable. Now I try always to teach my my students. Y'all need y'all have to deal with these issues and be be for real about talking about them. And I, my black students, I don't want you in here, uh, one up in some white students for an experience you didn't actually have. Hmm. Now you're looking at something on TV and you have a chance to whine and complain about some cops. Shoot, did nobody shoot you? The way you came from, you didn't even, but, and even if you came from there, even if you came from there, what does that have to do with what we're doing in here? My words are not that powerful. I, I started saying in 1985, I don't think we should have music talking about this and bitches and holes. It had no impact. I've said it, I've repeated it, I still repeat it. To me, that's more, that's more damaging than a statue of Robert E. Lee. That statue of Robert E. Lee took me. I saw the statue. My great uncle hated it. I talked about it. But try to talk somewhere in front of a group of black folks about turning that off. Man. He said, I talk to people about politics. I don't know that much about politics. And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, I know about music. I talk to people about music and about how demeaning these lyrics are, and they don't want to hear it. So something I do know something about, they don't want to hear. Something I know very little about, they're, yeah, yeah. There is a rapper named Kendrick Lamar. He invited the woman on stage during his set. But he stopped her after she repeatedly used the N-word, which is heard multiple times in the song. He told her, Quote, you got to bleep every one single word. 
And she said, quote, am I not cool enough for you, bro? Close quote. And then the people in the crowd started booing, hearing her sing the slur. And apparently she got what was going on. And then she said, quote, oh, I'm sorry. Did I do it? Close quote. So you invite somebody on stage to, quote, unquote, sing a rap song that has the N word in it several times. But this white fan is supposed to know she's not supposed to sing those lyrics. She's not supposed to hear them. She's not supposed to. She's supposed to edit them out when she hears them. Exactly. How does that work? But clearly the rapper is disturbed when a non-black person uses the N-word, yet puts it in the music and then invites a non-black person on the stage to sing it and then gets ticked off when the non-black person actually sings the N-word. Scotty, Scotty, Scotty. One more time. When I see my white friends who are now 50-something, we've been friends for a long time. And we have serious conversations like you have with, with long-term friends. And that was, that was the kind of characteristic of that, not let's have a meeting and discuss this statue and let's go argue and fight about black and white folks. It wasn't that way. It's interesting you, you downplay your, your impact and in, in, in your role. I wrote a column. We were just talking. Um, but do you, you surely recognize and see the power of your words and your, what's the word I'm looking for? Example's not the right word, but... My words are not that powerful. I, I started saying in 1985, I don't think we should have a music talk about this and bitches and holes. It had no impact. I've said it. I've repeated it. I still repeat it. To me, that's more, that's more damaging than a statue of Robert E. Lee. That statue of Robert E. Lee took me, I saw the statue. My great uncle hated it. I talked about it. But try to talk somewhere in front of a group of black folks about turning that off. Man, man. Well, well, okay. What's try, been your, what's been your them, experience? Try to ask them. Try to ask them not to do it. We, me and Cornell West talked at the Black Arts Festival. Man, I, you know, I talk about subjects I know little about politics and this and that. I spoke. Everybody, said, yeah, brother, yeah, brother. Oh, brother, yeah, I agree with you. The second we got on the one subject, I know I know more than anybody in that room about music. <laughs> when I started telling that they didn't want to hear that. Went in Marsalis. Now, let's get back to the NFL protest real quickly. A Seahawks, Seattle Seahawks wide receiver named Doug Baldwin said Trump is an idiot, plain and simple. I respect him, though. I respect him, but he's an idiot, plain and simple. Is there a sense that you're getting from your teammates and how they're processing it, how you guys are talking about it together? Uh, we're still processing it, to be honest with you. It's uh a little traumatizing, so it's going to take us a while to... Uh, it's a little traumatizing, the new policy. It's going to take them a while to digest it because... How do you... Uh, potentially be more divisive than you think? Absolutely. I think that the NFL really missed missed it this time. What did you think of uh, what President Trump said today about it? He's an idiot. Plain and simple. I mean, listen, you know, I, I, I respect the man uh, because he's a human being, you know, first and foremost, but... He's just being more divisive, which is not surprising. It is what it is, um, you know. But for him to say that uh, anybody who doesn't uh, follow his viewpoints or his constituents' viewpoints, you know, should be kicked out of the country, it's just. Which, of course, is not what he said, but that's all right. It's not very empathetic. It's not very. Uh, it's not very American-like, actually, to me. It's not very patriotic. It's not what this uh, this country was was founded upon. So it's kind of ironic to me that the president of the United States is contradicting what our what our country is really built on oh my goodness you don't want to be told what to do but you can be told when to show up for practice when to show up for weightlifting sessions when to show up for game sessions when to get on the bus curfew but you can't be told to stand respectfully so that you don't offend paying customers who pay your salary my goodness my brother Kirk up next. Phone a bro.